This is going to be verse by verse of Hebrews chapter 2. And we're going to start by looking at verse 9 in Hebrews 2, which says the phrase, But we see Jesus. So let's look at the topic of if you see Jesus. Number one, if you see Jesus, you see escape signs. The Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate escape plan. Whatever the problem may be, whether it be salvation or temptation, he is the way of escape. If he, or Hebrews 2.1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. 2 Timothy 1.13 says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So the words of God are like a rope that you hold on to while you're going through this world. Don't let it slip out of your hands. God has put in his word everything that you need to escape the flesh, the world, and the devil. Reading, memorizing, and studying, and meditating on the word will make it easier for you to see the escape. It says, give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. The things you have heard from the word of God need to be first and foremost in your life. Every decision you make should be based off of Bible principles that you have learned. Hebrews 2 through 3 says, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Notice that if the word spoken by angels was steadfast. In the Old Testament, the Lord used angels to communicate with man. Galatians 3.19 says the law was ordained by angels. The idea is if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, then how much more should you pay attention to what Jesus Christ said? Because Jesus Christ is better than the angels and realize that Hebrews is about Jesus being better in every aspect Hebrews 2 2 and 3 also says how shall we escape how shall we escape what look at the above verse again a just recompense of reward the just recompense for our sins is hell if a man neglects so great salvation, then the just recompense of reward for him is hell. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Jesus, who is our escape, if we neglect so great salvation. You know, you don't want to neglect your only way of escape. He took our sins on the cross. He said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way you can escape what you have coming to you. And also notice it says, which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord. Do you realize that God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, not only died for man, but came down to tell everyone he would die for them and how he would do it. He told them he was the escape. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? He even asked the question, how can ye escape? Jesus asked that question himself, letting you know there was something a man wants to escape. Matthew twenty three thirty three. he says, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape? the damnation of hell. And it says in Hebrews, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So the Lord comes down to man and spoke. What he said was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. This is the disciples that walked and talked with Jesus Christ. So another reason, or another, another thing that you'll see if you see Jesus, first off, you'll see escape, and you'll also see evidence. Not only did the Lord have the disciples confirming what he said, but the Lord also gave signs and miracles and wonders to the disciples to prove the word being preached. Hebrews 2, 4 says, God also bearing them witness, 
both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. People saw the evidence of what Jesus and the disciples preached because they confirmed the word with signs following. It says in Mark 16, 17 through 20, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So all these gifts you see the apostles have are gifts to confirm the word. These gifts were never to show that someone was more spiritual. Now in the days that we're living in, the sign gifts have temporarily ceased. 1 Corinthians one twenty two says the Jews require a sign. And after the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, the Lord began dealing with the Gentiles in the church. However, in the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, which is Israel, he goes back to dealing with the Jews, and the sign gifts will return because they are needful for them. But even though we don't see God doing these sign gifts as he did in the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, we still see evidence when we look to Jesus. We don't want to look for evidence like speaking in tongues and healing and casting out devils. That's not stuff for today. That stuff is temporarily seized. We're operating by faith, not by sight. And uh, I just recently seen where a young woman is is pretty much on her deathbed. And, you know, her husband is in mourning and he's writing things on Facebook talking about how some preacher came to him and said that he's prophesying that she's going to hold her grandbabies' babies and that uh, the de the angels are kicking the devil down ar around the hospital room and everything else. So what he's doing is, by saying that he sees her holding her grandbaby's babies, he's making a prophecy there. And by, he's not really thinking about what he's actually saying. If he's going to see her holding her grandbaby's babies then he's pretty much prophesying that the Lord's not coming back anytime soon because if she's going to see her grandbaby's baby, that's like 60 years from now. So the Lord's not going to come back for another 60 years. We're going to be here for another 60 years. He's predicting that her children, which are babies right now, are going to have a full life, which that's another prediction in itself. So what he's doing is he's making prophecies outside of the Bible. And we can't do that. We can't see the future. I mean, he, we're, we're not supposed to see the future other than what God's given us in the Bible. So you always need to watch out for people like that and say that that girl dies tomorrow. What's that going to do to the faith of her husband and her family who believed this person? But this man needs to just shut his mouth, quit acting like he's a preacher or that he's hooked up with God because what he's doing is he's lying and saying that he sees things that he doesn't. But that's not evidence of God. That's evidence of someone being stupid. But you still see evidence of God. Even though we don't do the sign gifts today, even though we don't, prophesied like Elijah did or someone from the Old Testament. We get our prophecy from the Bible because we have a short, more sure word of prophecy. When I read in the Old Testament, I can find Jesus Christ on every page. When I read the entire Bible, I can see God was at work putting together a perfect book written by some, so many different authors in different time periods and on different continents. That's the evidence. You see evidence in the in the sky and in the creation. I'm seeing Jesus Christ and looking at things through the lens of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2, 4 says, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So the devil loves to counterfeit Jesus Christ and his disciples. This is why he has... 
his ministers suddenly performed signs and wonders. The motive behind this for men today is mostly for money. They are greedy of filthy lucre. They're trying to make themselves a name. And I guarantee you one of those motives was behind this man saying that he sees the, the lady's future and that she's holding her grandbaby's babies. But today we look to the word of God. That is all the evidence we need. If they find Noah's Ark, it wouldn't make me believe the Bible any more than I already do. The Bible says in the book of Romans, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. You can see things that are invisible through things that are visible. You can see that this world had to have a creator by looking at the creation. If you see Jesus, you see evidence. The evidence is there even if we're not operating with signs and miracles during this time. But the next thing you see if you see Jesus is earth's hero. In Hebrews 2, 5, it says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Second Peter 2, 12 shows the angels are greater in power and might when it comes to our human flesh. They are greater in power and might than we are. However, we are superior to them in the sense that we will reign with Jesus Christ one day. That They will not. He had not put in subjection the world to come to the angels. This is all because Jesus Christ is earth's hero that we get to, to reign. It wouldn't be possible for us to reign one day if he never died in our place. Hebrews 2, 6 says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? What would make us so special that God would manifest himself in the flesh to come down to earth and die for all of mankind? God is much more superior to us than we, than we are to a brain-dead ant. If you got a brain-dead ant, you're so much more smarter than him. But Jesus Christ is even more smarter than you than you are of that ant. And he's mindful of us and he visits us. Hebrews 2, 7 says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. So thou madest him a little lower than the angels. The Lord, the Lord made man a little lower than the angels. And as we talked about, the angels are greater in power and might. Uh, they don't die unless they leave their first estate. Then if they do that, they die like men, according to Psalms 82. So God made man a little lower than the angels. He put man in a garden and gave him dominion, as it says in Genesis 128. Hebrews 2.8 says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So man lost both kingdoms. Now we see not all things put under him. The only way for you to get back into the kingdom of God is for you to be born again. That's how you get it. The moment you believe the gospel, you enter the kingdom of God and you get the image of God back that Adam once had before he lost it. Then after that, if you suffer for Jesus Christ and live for him, then you can reign with him in the literal, physical, visible kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ is earth's hero. And he's going to get the kingdom back from the forces of darkness. As it says in Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hebrews 2, 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So he, Jesus, was made a little lower than the angels. This doesn't mean Jesus was a created being. This is talking about when Jesus Christ came in the flesh, he was made a little lower than the angels only because he was put in the likeness of man who's made a little lower than the angels. 
He put on flesh that could die. Jesus was born to die for the sins of man. He was made in the likeness of man. And in that sense, he's made a little lower than the angels. He was made a little lower than the angels for what? For the suffering of death. Angels can't die unless they leave their first estate. So Jesus took on the likeness of man. Don't get mixed up with on verse 9. It isn't saying that angels are superior to Jesus. What the idea is, is that Jesus Christ took on human flesh to come down to earth. In that sense, he was made a little lower than the angels. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So he tasted death for every man. Jesus Christ shedding his blood on the cross wasn't just for a select few, it was for every man. 1 Timothy 2.6 says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He died for every single sin ever committed. That includes rejection of him and homosexuality, murder, adultery. It includes blasphemy. 1 John 2.2 2 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Salvation is free. He paid for the sins of all mankind. He's already paid for your sins. Now it's just up to you to accept the payment. A true hero will die to save somebody, and Jesus Christ laid down his life for his enemies. Hebrews 2, 9 through 10, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So it says it became him, it suited him. He was the one for the job because only he could do it. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Jesus Christ is the only one with saving power. Notice it says, For whom are all things, and by whom are all things. Everything you see when you look outside came about because Jesus Christ made it. This world is too big for me and you. Jesus Christ is too big for the world. Everything you see was made for his pleasure. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things. So it was made by by him and for him. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Revelation four eleven. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So Jesus Christ is the creator. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things. Hebrews 2.10, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So Jesus Christ brought many sons to glory. John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the moment you got saved, you were put into the royal family of God. You became a son of God. He is the captain of our salvation. He is the head. If the body of Christ was a ship, then he is the one in control driving it. He is the captain of the ship. Notice Hebrews 2, 10 says, To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. This doesn't mean that Jesus Christ wasn't always sinless. The idea is that Jesus Christ had to come down as a man, fulfill all righteousness, suffer in the flesh, and suffer the death on the cross. 
This had to be done to pay our sin debt. He was made perfect through sufferings. The devil, devil could no longer look at God saying, you've never went through what man goes through. He could, yeah, the devil could no longer say that because God came down in the flesh and went through it. He also did it infinite times better than any man ever did it. He is earth's hero. And next you see, if you see Jesus, then you see everything you need. Hebrews 2.11 says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He is the sanctifier. He gives you everything you need to be saved and everything you need to live the crucified life. And it says we are all of one. Because the moment we get saved, we are put into the body of the one that sanctifies. And sanctified means set apart. You were sanctified eternally the moment you got saved. And in the physical sense, as your body is on here on this earth, you have to willingly sanctify yourself every day. Your standing in Jesus Christ is always sanctified. However, your flesh at any given moment may not be sanctified depending on how you're living. This has to do with your state. You want to get your state to match your standing as close as you possibly can. Now, Hebrews 2.11 says, He is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus Christ is your big brother. And some people say, I always wanted a brother. Well, get saved and you'll have an older brother. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Jesus Christ is all you need. He will be your big brother. You're going to be part of the royal family of God if you get saved. Hebrews 2.12 says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Notice he calls you brethren again. He says, in the midst of the church. And this is a quote from Psalms 22.22. 22. So this gives you the definition of church. In Psalms 22.22 22, it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So the definition of church is congregation. The church isn't a building, it is people. In the building in the er, in the Bible you have the church, which is made up of all born again believers, and you also have churches which are local assemblies of believers, a congregation. Hebrews two thirteen says, And again I will put my trust in him, and again behold, I am the children which God hath given me. So notice it says the children which God hath given me. Not only is Jesus Christ a <clears throat> a brother to us, but he is a father to us as well. He is everything you need. You can't explain it. To top it all, we are also his bride. In Ephesians 5, 24 and 25, it says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Then in Romans 7, 4, it says, Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Second Corinthians 11.2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I, might, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So Jesus Christ is everything you need. He's a brother. He's a father. He's the bridegroom. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ is all you need. And when you look at Jesus Christ, you see everything you need. And, and the next one, when you look at Jesus Christ, you see evil punished. Hebrews 2.14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So he also himself likewise took part of the same. This has to do with the fact that Jesus Christ likewise came down to earth in flesh and blood through the virgin birth 
He didn't have an earthly father because God was his father. And Acts 20, 28 shows us that the blood of Jesus Christ was God's blood because he was God manifested in the flesh. And John 1, 14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ came to earth on a mission. That mission was to die on the cross to defeat death and the devil. The same way Samson took out enemies of God when he willingly offered himself is the same way that Jesus Christ took out the enemies of God willingly offering himself. Through death he destroyed him that had the power of death. And if you look at Colossians two fourteen and 15, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now listen to this. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them op openly, triumphing over them in it. The devil had the power of death. But when Jesus Christ resurrected, he got the keys of hell and of death. And he made a show of the devil and unclean spirits op openly and triumphed over them in it. You know, he made a show out of it. It was no contest. Uh, Revelation 118 says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. That's Jesus Christ. He stole the keys. He took, I mean, it was his anyway. He took them back. You don't have to fear death anymore if you're saved. Your body may die, but your soul will never die. It will go to be with Jesus Christ. This is why Paul says in Hebrews 2.15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. They didn't know where they were going when they died. But now we can know for certain where we're going when we die. Because we have Jesus Christ as their Savior who has the keys of hell and of death. 2 Corinthians 5.8 We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The moment you leave this body, you're going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. So if you see Jesus, you see evil punished. He punishes the devil all throughout the Bible. He punishes his men throughout the Bible. He's going to throw the Antichrist and the false prophet in the lake of fire. And he's going to eventually throw the devil in there too. So you see evil punished. And the next thing is you see enemies reconciled. When G you see Jesus Christ, you see the person who took the Father's hand and man's hand to lock them back together. Because your sin separated you from God, the moment you realized you were a sinner is the moment you became dead to sin. With, dead and in sin you were the enemy of God Paul said in Romans 7 9 for I was alive without the law once but when the commandment came <clears throat> sin revived and I died so that's when you become God's enemy you became God's enemy the moment you realized that you were a sinner you were on your way to hell Jesus came to reconcile the enemies of God Romans 5.10 says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. 2 Corinthians 5.18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Colossians 1.21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled. The moment you believe the gospel, you are reconciled to God. Jesus Christ took you and put you in the Father's hand. Now no man can pluck you out of his hand. Hebrews 2.16 For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. In the Old Testament you see Jesus Christ show himself to man as the angel of the Lord. This was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. When he came in the flesh, he did not take on him the nature of angels. He took on him the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ was a Jew. He came into his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. He took on the seed of Abraham. He was of the lineage of David and the tribe of Judah 
And this is why he is called the line of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5.5. 5. But Hebrews 2.17, Wherefore in all things it, beho it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So you see that in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. It was fitting for him to take on the likeness of man and come down to earth to die for man. He did this and became a faithful high priest, a much better high priest, than any man ever was. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. So he was superior to other priests in that he, he only had to make the offering one time. And he was sinless. Those earthly priests were not sinless. So he didn't have to make an offering for himself like they did. Hebrews seven twenty six and 27 says, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily to, as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So he didn't have to offer up sacrifice for himself because he was sinless. Hebrews ten eleven through 12 says, And every high priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So Jesus Christ is a better high priest. He's better than the angels, and he's a better high priest. Hebrews two eighteen For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Jesus Christ left the riches of heaven to come down to this world. And here he was tempted and tried and tested. And he passed every test that man would have to pass to be considered righteous. He fulfilled all righteousness. You can't be righteous enough to get into heaven. You have to get righteousness from the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you come to Jesus as the unrighteous sinner that you are and believe the gospel then he will give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You will then be the Son of God. You will be a friend of God. You will be one of the brethren. You will be part of the bride. You will be reconciled.